Hello everybody, happy Friday. Welcome to this Instagram Live. I'm Dr. Natalie Gentili, and I'm gonna be joined by Dr. Sandra Sobel, and we're gonna be talking about injectable weight loss meds. So as people are hopping on, I'm just getting ready to take some notes because I know this is going to be very interesting and people are gonna probably wanna watch this back um, and learn from it. So Dr. Sobel will be joining us shortly. And please feel free to pop questions in the chat here and we'll be answering those as they come up. Hi, Dr. Sobel. Hi, Dr. Gentili, how are you? I am good great. To see this is so good to see you, my friend, and, and wonderful to be uh, learning from you today. So welcome everybody. We've got Dr. Sandra Sobel here and I'm Dr. Natalie Gentili. Uh, Dr. Sobel and I work together uh, as colleagues and friends. Do you wanna give us an introduction, Dr. Sobel, about yourself? Sure, thank you. So my name is Sandra Sobel. I am a board certified endocrinologist and I also have a board certification in lifestyle medicine as well as obesity medicine. And so my passion within the field of endocrinology is in metabolic health. And so what I really focus on are disorders of insulin resistance such as metabolic syndrome, prediabetes, type 1, type 2, even PCOS, fatty liver disease, and excess weight. So that's what we're here to talk about. And I have a direct care practice here in Pittsburgh that um, focuses on that. And I like to take a really comprehensive approach to metabolic health. So I do a lot of um, plant-based nutrition counseling, which I know we're both really passionate about, exercise and the inefficiency in exercise, which we're passionate about, talking about stress and sleep, how that impacts metabolic health, and then the medicines, which is the meat of what we're going to be talking about. Because that is also an essential component and part of the management. And I'm so happy that you're also making this um, a, a topic to bring to light and, and discuss, because I'm sure a lot of people are curious. And, and there is also some misunderstandings about it. Absolutely. And it's something that is being done in primary care as well, you know, which is why I'm so passionate about this, because in my direct primary care practice, I'm doing this and talking about this with patients, but I always love to have, you know, you as a resource um, and somebody that I've learned so much from and that patients are learning so much from. And I think it would be great for people to watch this back and be able to learn and understand these options better. Absolutely. And, and let me also be clear, like our primary care physicians are like the fabric of the health system. And so number one, it's important for people to have a primary care physician who they can go to and trust and listens to them and 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 because they're they're the ones that are dealing with all of our medical conditions um, from the dump and there are so many new things that come and um, and so I also love partnering with you as well as other primary care physician colleagues because it has to be a team effort there is no way that it's just siloed in one area of medicine so our topic today has to do with weight loss medications. And I think it's important that we preface this discussion by saying a couple of things. Your weight is not your worth. And a lot of times when people come into a healthcare setting, all of their ailments and issues are boiled down to your weight. Oh, it's your weight. And therefore, people who are of a quote unquote healthier weight must not have any of these problems and therefore don't need to be screened for metabolic disease, um, which we know is not true. However, there are patients that are gonna come in who are going to desire weight loss. And part of the discussion, a very broad comprehensive discussion may come down to weight loss medications. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I wanna just um, support everything you just said. And it's, we all associate and recognize like weight loss as being you know this common term, but really what we're talking about is excess unhealthy fat mass. That's a mouthful so that we don't say it that way. But that's, to your point, people can have what we consider a normal weight, but they still have excess unhealthy fat depending on where it is, right? And so that's why it has to go beyond a number on the scale. It's not about the number on the scale. It's about does somebody have excess unhealthy fat mass? And that's what we're targeting because that's the one that's associated with a lot of complex and um, medical conditions. Absolutely. A lot has happened in the field of medications for excess unhealthy fat mass loss. <laughs> and and yeah. or, or as we call it in the general population. We'll, we'll make it a thing. It'll roll off the tip of the tongue so it easily, right? 
we should come up with some kind of like TLDR version of that. Okay, I, I remember back in residency, you know, doing a, a talk for the family med department about weight loss medications. And like, when I look at those, that talk now, it's so outdated, you know, I mean, it has so much improved in less than a decade. Um, and what we, I really would like to cover today is the injectable medications. Yeah. So can you tell us about GLP-1 agonist? What does that yeah. even mean? Yeah, absolutely. So um, that's, and that's an exciting thing about medicine too, right? Is that the field is constantly changing. Innovation is constantly happening. And also is why it's important that you have a physician who's board certified, right? That has to stay up to date on all this innovation, right? Because there are a lot of different centers that open up that offer like things that um, are not safe, have not been studied, um, and haven't had the same scrutiny. And so making sure you're working with a professional who understands the physiology and the complexities and the risks and benefits of, of different therapies. So GLP-1, what is that? So GLP-1 stands for glucagon-like peptide 1. When, so obesity, I'm going to call it obesity, is a medical condition. Okay, it's a medical condition. So someone, like they have diabetes, they have hypertension, they have obesity. And for some, it's, it, it's awkward to hear it. It's like, oh, this person has obesity. But it's a medical condition like other ones. And so it also has a very complex physiology of hormonal signaling. And so, for example, we have two signaling pathways in our brain. One of the signaling pathways is one that promotes weight gain and holds on to weight. That, for those science nerds out there, that's the agouti-related peptide and um, neuropeptide Y pathway. And then we have the other signaling pathway, which is the POMC CART pathway, which actually increases energy expenditure and defends a lower body weight. And so these are the two pathways in our brain that are sort of at, you know, trying to find what a person's baseline is. And so the hormones um, involved in appetite regulation, satiety, energy expenditure, there are so many. So for example, Ghrelin is a hormone secreted by the greater curvature of the stomach, and that actually makes someone hungry and seeks food. And it's super potent. As we eat, ghrelin goes down. And as we eat, we get a release of cholecystokinin, uh, GLP-1, oxyntomodulin, insulin, amylin, um, peptide YY, so, and leptin. And all of these are just to counter that one hormone ghrelin. That is how potent ghrelin is. So GLP-1 is a hormone that's secreted by the distal intestine and the colon. And what this hormone does, it's a hormone that all of our bodies make. And it leads to a decreased transit of food to the body. Um, when we eat and glucose levels go up, it helps support insulin release dependent on your blood glucose. It also acts as a central appetite suppressant. So you heard me talk about the, um, the uh, signaling pathways in the brain. And so that's what GLP-1 does. It's is this really sophisticated hormone that has multiple actions to, in general, what it helps um, do is lead to decreased food-seeking behavior, um, increased satiety, and improved insulin sensitivity. Okay. And GLP-1 agonists, meaning that it's something that promotes GLP-1 release, this is what the most of these injectable meds are aiming for. Correct. So the GLP-1 agonists, so that's the fancy term of saying this medicine that is injected, as a sidebar, they also have one that now you can take orally, but we're talking about the injectable ones, which are more potent for weight loss and, um, and blood sugar control for those who have diabetes. Um, it, it interacts with the same receptor of GLP-1 and promotes those same um, um, actions that our native GLP-1 does. And so exactly right. When we inject these medications, these are the effects that we can expect to happen. And there are two different types, right? So there is a short-acting GLP-1. And what I mean by that is that you have to inject it daily. Okay. Okay. And so that's called loraglutide. That's the generic name. If we're only using it for weight loss purposes, so the FDA approved weight loss purpose, that um, brand name is called Succenda, okay? And that's a daily injection. 
Um, and then there's the long-acting GLP-1 receptor agonist, and we inject that once a week. And the um, generic name is called semaglutide, and the brand name is called Wegovi, if we're using it for only the weight loss purposes. Exactly. Some people have heard of it as Ozempic, and that would be for diabetes, and also with the other effect of weight loss. Correct. So this, it's really fascinating, you know, with all these studies too, what happens is um, these medicines were initially developed for the purpose of type 2 diabetes. And when they were performing these studies, what they noticed was in addition to A1C benefit and blood sugar lowering, it also had a significant weight loss um, component. And so then those who the manufacturers were like, huh, I wonder, what if we gave this medicine to people who don't have diabetes? Will they also experience weight loss and will it have benefit too? So they performed those studies and they're really rigorous studies. And lo and behold, absolutely, people had meaningful weight loss with these medications without having type 2 diabetes. And so then these medications got rebranded as a different name, slightly different doses also, and also are charging a lot more money for them, but that's a different conversation for another day. And, and now get, um, get promoted as, as that, the weight loss medications. So, um, so Sixenda is the daily one, and that is the same medicine as Victoza, which is used in diabetes. And um, Wegovi is the same exact medication as Ozempic, which has the FDA approval for type 2 diabetes. And then there is the new one. That's the new kid on the block. The new kid on the block, which is super <laughs> sexy. And everybody yeah. wants it, you know, yeah. with Naro, um, which is, with a significant improvement in the weight loss effects and changes in body weight after 72 weeks compared to Ozempic and Wegovi. Yes, absolutely. So um, this was, uh, this is, one of the other medications, I mean, that we've been really excited about. It's been in the pipeline for some time. And so the generic name of Monjaro is known as terzepatide. So terzepatide is known as a twin critin. okay? So when I was explaining, you know, what a GLP-1 does naturally in our body, it's, it's a hormone that's known as an incretin. And now GIP is also, um, has these properties of incretin properties and now combined um, what this medicine does is it attaches to both the GIP so GIP stands for glucose dependent insulinotropic peptide so we'll just keep it at GIP so another, GIP another <laughs> so GIP and um, it attaches to both the GIP receptor so it's a GIP agonist as well as the GLP receptor. It's a GLP-1 agonist, so it's a dual agonist. It has more affinity, it tends to bind more to the GIP receptor than it does to the GLP, okay? And um, one of, again, it has the effect of assisting the pancreas with insulin release if blood sugars go high. It slows down the transit of food through the body. One of the important things I, I forgot to mention before, it also suppresses glucagon release. That's really important, okay? And it also has central acting behaviors, so it decreases appetite. Um, and the study results were profound, right? They were published in the New England Journal of Medicine just in this past June, 2022. And the reason, Natalie, right, that all of us physicians who manage obesity are really excited about it is because this is the first time we saw a medication that is rivaling the weight loss outcomes of metabolic surgery. Mm -hmm. And metabolic surgery is a wonderful tool to have, right? There are many people who require this type of surgery for a variety of reasons, and we're lucky we live in a city that has excellent metabolic surgeons. But surgery is not for everybody. Not everybody wants it. And so now to have a pharmacotherapy where it is able to offer the amount of weight loss that rivals metabolic surgery is huge. Yes. So, um, so and, and what do I mean by that? Well, you know, in general, for example, gastric sleeve sur um, surgery, 
we're talking about a weight loss on average of about 20 to 25% from, from the initial weight, right? Um, Ruin Y gastric bypass, 25 to 30, 35% or so, okay? Um, and most of the weight loss medications on the market before Ozempic and, excuse me, before Wegovy and Monjaro came out, um, was about, like, at best, about 9%. It, not too shabby. So, you know, it was, they were very helpful, and more so than lifestyle changes alone. Ozempic, uh, Wegovy, uh, you hear me interchange, Ozempic Wegovy came on the market, and the average weight loss is about 12%, which is what's reported in the studies. Mm -hmm. Nice, better than the 9%. Amazing. Um, now we have Trizepatide, and it has, you know, different doses, and for example, the five milligram dose, you get 15% weight loss. With the 10 milligram dose, the study showed about 19% weight loss. And the 15 milligram dose, 21% weight loss. Now we're in the territory of gastric sleeve surgery. That's surgery. Right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So it, it is, it, it's something, it's, this is like, what, right? Like what we geek out about. This is so exciting to have this type of innovation and tools to be able to think about our patient who's sitting in front of us, what their desires are, what their um, comorbidities are, and choose the appropriate regimen for that one person that's personalized for them and, and have that as one of those options. Exactly. And who, so most, most patients aren't going to come see someone like me or you. So most patients are going to be in a traditional primary care office where there's yeah. not much time and the physician is unlikely to be, you know, knowledgeable about this and kind of offer it as a solution and might even say, go get weight loss surgery or like go to a major. I literally just heard that this morning from a prospective patient that they were told you just need to go, you know, to the major medical center for weight loss surgery. And like, there's a lot before we get to that point. So where does a patient go then? What, who should they be seeking out um, to find more knowledge about this from a, you know, a board certified who and where? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So one of the things I would say is, as with many metabolic conditions in which obesity is also part of, always, 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 the first thing that really needs to be instituted for anything to work is our lifestyle changes, right? Um, and we all know, yes, diet, exercise, diet, exercise. And it's not as simple as that, but diet and exercise, nutrition and movement are all a necessary part of this, okay? And so if, if your physician or medical team isn't sitting down and having this discussion with you, then you need to seek out physicians and medical teams who are board certified in lifestyle medicine, who are aware of what the specific recommendations are when it comes to nutrition, who partner with nutrition experts. We have amazing dietitians who support us and we work with, who can help counsel patients, um, where we really talk about like, what does eating better mean? Because if we just sit, if, if in a traditional medical model where you only have 12 minutes with the person, you're not gonna get specific and really actionable advice about your nutrition. And so, like I said in the, in the beginning, I know we're both passionate about the importance of how we fuel our bodies and, and that has a profound impact, right? Um, and then also movement and, and the importance of exercise and what that means and the different types of exercise and, and how we can use that to our benefit to help support the weight that we've lost, right? So I definitely think it's beneficial for individuals who have enough time with their physicians and have physicians or medical teams that are experts in lifestyle medicine, understand lifestyle medicine. And then for really complicated patients, right? Like, and usually there, that's like great. And, and that's, you'll get enough to, to be able to start that path. And with that, if you notice change or you get to a point in plateau, which tends to happen with weight loss, then there are other things that you can address, which brings in the pharmacotherapies. And there's a myriad of pharmacotherapies and medicines that we can use for weight loss, which are necessary. And it's important for me to say, using a medicine for weight loss is not the easy way out. It is not a cop out. You heard me say how it is a medical condition with complex you know, hormonal physiology. 
And so it is also something that I think is important as we as physicians mentioned at the beginning too, for people who are specifically coming for that reason, like, listen, if it were as simple as like, you know, diet and exercise, we wouldn't be having this conversation because these patients have already tried it all and they're super disciplined with it, right? So there's a lot of complex physiology that's at play. And so then having in physicians who are very interested in the physiology of obesity is important as well. And so, you know, you are one of those colleagues of mine that I know that I'm like, listen, Dr. Gentile on top of it. And then you can also um, seek out board certified, obesity medicine board certified uh, specialists too, who have gone under that training to also get further knowledge and understanding of the complexities of the physiology. And, and really forming and working with that medical team. Um, and I do a lot of group medical visits with my patients. And this is just all to say that you're not alone. So if you're out there listening to this and you've been told, you know, this is a willpower thing, it's not. I do these group visits and literally every single person, we've had age ranges from 30s to 70s. They've all said the same thing. They've all felt like it's a willpower issue. And if it's a willpower issue, how is it that everyone's experiencing that? <laughs> there is a physiologic background to this as well, as Dr. Sobel ex you know, has explained to us. And so this is a medical condition that we have ways to treat that run a very broad gamut of options. Um, so, it's, so it's important to understand that and not feel shame. We have a question uh, in here. The only way I lose weight is literally starving myself. Wondering if you could help. Do you want to start, Dr. Sobel? And then I can pop sure. in. <laughs> sure. Absolutely. Well, how about this? I'll let you go first because, again, like this is something where it's usually our primary care physician. This is right? where we start. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's this, I think, speaks to the importance of seeing a physician who and a team that is um, well-versed in lifestyle medicine. Because when I have a patient who's come, um, like this comment has, has um, you know, somebody with this exact same type of commentary or history, what we dive into is very intensive. So it's not unusual to need to do food logging and following up on food logging and continuity of care over a week's and week's period of time, talking about mood, uh, digestive health, um, overall mental health and mental health history, medication review, um, what and when you are eating and your emotions around what and when you are eating. And when you start to really dive in that deep, a lot comes to light. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if you're told that you need to be on this restrictive diet and that's the only way you're gonna lose weight, it's highly likely that you've got a lot of other factors that just have not been reviewed and discussed. Yeah, and absolutely. Um, so the medication part that you brought up is really important because oftentimes there are medications that people might take um, regularly and not realize that that's actually contributing to um, weight gain. So for example, some of the sleep aids have Benadryl, Benadryl in general. Benadryl causes weight gain. And if people are using that on a routine basis to help them fall asleep, that is contributing to weight gain. One of the very important cardiac meds, and I'm not saying that they shouldn't be on this, but again, to just understand Metoprolol, which is a beta blocker, is known to lead to weight gain. Carvedilol is, is one of the, the ones that are weight, more weight neutral. So, you know, having that discussion with your physician, is that okay to switch? Sometimes it's not. But again, like I think that helps people also understand like, oh, this isn't a willpower thing. There is like, you know, there are really complex things that are resisting the weight loss. Multiple doses of Medrol dose packs or prednisone packs, right, steroids. Um, classic lead to increased weight. Um, and so, no, you do not need to starve yourself to lose weight because that's just not sustainable. And, and then you get this really unhealthy relationship with food. We absolutely can help, right? Going through like, okay, let's talk about these behaviors. What is it that you've eaten? What have you experienced? How did you achieve that weight loss? In what length of time? What is your exercise to help support the weight loss once you've lose? lost it, you know, this inefficiency and in exercise um, concept. And then sleep. What's your sleep like? You know, if your sleep is really disrupted, then you're going to regain weight, right? So that's also very complex in this physiology. What's your stress like? We know ghrelin levels increase when you're highly stressed. And then the pharmacotherapy, which is what we're talking about, then you have to use medicine. And that's okay, because that's part of the physiology. Yes. So it really is that comprehensive approach looking at an entire human being that is so important and unfortunately not a thing in the traditional 
you know, healthcare model. Um, and it's so imperative to find a physician and a medical team who support that lifestyle centered approach. Um, question real quick about these medications. Anything people should be watching out for for side effects? Sure, absolutely. Anytime you start a new medicine, you should always be aware of what the potential side effects are. Um, because these medications only work if you're taking them. And sometimes if you start taking it and experience something and get really nervous about it, you might just completely stop it. And if you know what to anticipate and you do get some of that side effect, you might be like, okay, I was expecting this. This is something that's known. And you can discuss, reach out to your physician and see, is this okay for me to continue taking? So because of the way it works, it has a lot of gastrointestinal side effects. Okay. And so what does that mean? get some bloating, um, some people report nausea, and then constipation and diarrhea or diarrhea. Those are the most commonly reported. Now, most of my patients who take these medications have done just fine with them and have not had these side effects. Some of them have them very mild. I'm like, oh yeah, I noticed I started something new and with each dose titration, you notice it. So you always start at the lowest, lowest dose, and depending on response to the dose, um, you keep on going up and up on the dose, but you never want to go straight to the highest dose because that you can have a really severe side effect from that. Um, so those are the m most reported ones. You should not be placed on a GLP-1 like Wegovy or Succenda or the uh, trisepatide, the GIP1, GLP1, if you've had a history of pancreatitis. So it's not so much that it causes it. In studies, there have been reports of pancreatitis, and so anyone with a history of pancreatitis, then therefore on the label, it says they should not be prescribed this medication. So it's an important question to screen and ask our patients about before we prescribe the medication. And I would add to that, lastly, um, it's not necessarily a side effect, but it's a potential contraindication or, or reason to not use these meds. Have your doc who's prescribing these meds look at the other meds you're on, because especially for our diabetic patients who have kind of gone from doc to doc to doc over the years and all of a sudden have a laundry list of medications, these types of meds may not be a good idea to take if you're already taking a similar type of diabetes medication on your meds list. Absolutely. Oh, Natalie, I just need to like clone you, right? I'm like, can I just send all my patients to you, right? To, to have that type of detail. And that's a really important because it's easy to add medicines. It takes a, just a little bit of time to look and see what they're already on. But that little bit of time is so important because what this is about is minimizing the number of medications, but still getting the maximum effect and not about how many can a person take um, because then you increase the amount of potential um, like cross reactivity with medications and and side effects too. So Plus the uh, cost and the burden of more medications, you know, it's never, never, you know, okay. So um, I know we're coming to the end of our discussion and I'm so grateful for your time, Dr. Silva. This was super enlightening for anybody who's watching this. This will be recorded and make sure to, um, you can go up to the little arrow up at the top of the screen and follow uh, Dr. Sobel and myself to learn more about this. We try to break down information into understandable you know, ways that patients can relate to um, and try to have some evidence-based real talk when it comes to metabolic health, lifestyle medicine, and so much more. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Gentili, for having me and looking forward to more discussions. Thank you all for joining. Bye. Bye.